this is Todd. Happy day of the week that I can't remember because we're all in coronavirus time now. As you can see, I have got a bit of a hockey playoff style beard growing and I have to shave desperately my hair. It's just uh, the new realities of life with, the, life with uh, the coronavirus lockdown. I'm here safe with my family in Brooklyn. The other two members of my family are out, so that gives me a few minutes this morning to chat about something. I was kind of racking my brains actually since uh, I had a couple of topics but I hadn't really fleshed them out a lot there's my cat chiming in yeah hi Betty I hadn't fleshed them out a ton so I guess I'll throw this up as a screed I'll just drop some things out there and uh, start a conversation maybe we can just see where it takes us in the comments and maybe that'll give me some things to uh, some ideas to expound upon in future videos I do want to do a stream. I actually had a couple of chances this week to stream, and I kind of kicking, kind of kicking myself, or I am sort of kicking myself a little bit for missing those opportunities. But the you know other other work and life things just getting in the way. I was just super tired, not very energetic, and so it makes it hard late at night when I'm thinking, oh, everyone's going to bed. I have a chance to stream, and then I just don't have the energy. So. Hopefully I can rectify that soon because I do have some things that I want to stream that I can do in sort of a short form. And I've mentioned this in a couple of the stream videos, so I apologize this is repetitive, but just one of the problems that I have right now is that in a small apartment that I'm sharing with my partner, my wife, who is working from home, my daughter, who obviously is not in school right now. And I think in New York City, they decided that they're not reopening. So she's not going back to school until the fall, theoretically. And we don't know what camps and summer things are, uh, are going to be available to us, services, so hard to know when the situation is going to change, which I guess everyone is, is dealing with, but hard to find the time. You know, I have some big books and some big things that I want to stream on. Even breaking down the multiple parts, I maybe usually will have an hour, an hour and a half, and two hours if I push it, if I stay up late past everybody else and have the energy to do it, that I can do it. And that's including kind of set up and tear down for me, which I have to do. You know, I have to set up kind of an area, get everything going, hook all the cables up, test auto, do the everything. It doesn't leave me with a ton of time. So I've been trying to stick to kind of shorter things, or I've even been doing a more abbreviated form. I think when I did Keep on the Borderlands the last one, which uh, if you're interested in that one, you can check out the video. And I have an edited version and the raw stream. You know, that one I even kind of sped through a little bit because I recognize that I don't have a ton of energy. It is late and I didn't want to get it out. So it's a struggle that I have, but I do have some shorter things that I, I want to do. It's just a matter of finding time to do it. As far as topics for right now, one of the things I think maybe I got my highest, my highest upvoted comment on Reddit from a post and you know, I, I'm not going to call out the uh, Reddit user while well, I, I don't have their name in front of me. And if I did, uh, it was kind of a funny little comment that he made or question that he left on one of the D&D subreddits and it was interesting because well for one he didn't take it down and usually you see these comments or you see a question come up or a statement someone will throw up on reddit and maybe it doesn't quite get the response they're looking for and then it's quickly deleted as best that they can and it just kind of gets stuck there and you just look at it and it's oh you know you check it and you respond and you maybe you come back later because you think oh I wonder how they responded to my response or how other people responded and then all you see is deleted, deleted. All the comments are kind of left as sort of hanging chads off of this this original post that's no longer there. This person, you know, it's been a few days now and uh, they left it up there. So on the one hand, you know, hey, props to them because it can be tough to do when you put something and I'm not sure what response he was looking for or she, I don't know, they were looking for. But I don't think they got a lot of that in the thread. And so what they were saying was that they, uh, and he's a player, not a, not a GM, so he's playing in a game the players ran across an NPC and the GM, and again, we don't have a lot of context for this or how it worked or what, any any broader context in terms of what the situation was than the very just abbreviated thing in his post title and post, which was the DM basically played off an NPC like they were not pre-generated. I guess so they were random or I think the term, I think the exact terms I want to get, the exact thing that he said was they, they acted, they acted, and again, this comes to kind of the end of the story, they acted like this NPC was something that they had just whipped up. So maybe they were reaching for a name and they're, you know, oh, you meet a farmer. Oh, he's a uh, farmer Dave. Call him farmer Dave. Okay, you meet farmer Dave. All right. So I guess the players took this and instead of looking at the situation kind of in the fiction, on a meta level, they thought to themselves, oh, this, this is nobody. So I guess we can roll him for pocket change or do whatever. Now, there's nothing in the what the guy posted the red to say what they did. But he did say that, hey, they thought it was a nothing PC. Turns out it was 
far from a nothing PC. Now they're looking at an NPC. Now they're looking for at a TPK. And I think my comment was, well, if you were just doing it on a meta level, just thinking like, oh, he doesn't know the PC's name, therefore this PC isn't important. Therefore, regardless of anything going on in the game, let's just roll him for his pocket change. Like, I don't have too much sympathy for you. And I, I stand by that. And I think that's how most of the comments were. It was more sort of chuckling at the situation where they just took this meta knowledge that they thought they had, looking at the GM saying, ooh, the GM didn't know his name. The GM's trying to think of a name. The GM's scrambling. And so we can use that knowledge. And as players, that means that this guy is not doesn't have any connections, it's just a guy hanging on a field or wherever wherever this NPC happened to be, and now we can just kind of, I don't know, torture him, kill him, rob him, whatever it is. And then lo and behold, he turns out he's a powerful NPC in disguise, oh my gosh, what can we do? Or, you know, what did we do? And most people were like me, like, hey, you know, if you were trying to bet on guessing the GM's game plan and you fail, then that's kind of on you. A few people did respond saying that, oh, if this was a some a powerful somebody they should set that up or do something but the the thing is is these this has nothing to do with right? we don't know what the what the situation in the fiction was we all we know is that these guys got it in their brain this party of players got in their brain that this was not a pc of npc of consequence therefore we can mess with them which is kind of i would think is a, a, a bad way to play the game trying to guess now look we do it all the time at different levels at different levels. It's not always a bad thing. I think this gets in the whole, oh, metagaming, is it awful, is it terrible? There's, metagaming, I think, is like the, the fat of RPGs. And what I mean by that is that if you ever get into dieting or looking at nutrition, you'll say, oh, there's good fats and there's bad fats, and you want to. Good fats are actually good and probably misunderstood, and the bad fats are really bad and you should stay away from them. I, in the same way, I think metagaming has some good things that we count on that are often misunderstood or not realized as being metagaming. And then there's the bad kinds of this, which I believe is one which you should avoid. The good kinds are the kind of things that, hey, if you would, you would invite me to your OSR game, really any D&D game, and I'm playing Bob the Dirt Farmer, who's a first level, I don't know, first level bard, and you say, okay, Bob, you're leaving home to go on your first, first adventure, oh, you have a stop at the general store in town and you got, whatever, 80 gold pieces or silver pieces, whatever, what do you buy? And I'll say, okay, I'm going to buy cow traps, I'm going to buy oil, I'm going to buy a 100 feet of rope, I'm going to buy a 10 foot pole. I'm going to buy a hammer, I'm going to buy some uh, door spikes, what else am I going to I'm going to buy some torches, I'm going to buy a bedroll, I'm going to buy all this gear, okay? And now, if you're looking at it simply in a fictional sense, right, and we're saying that metagaming is bad, then the GM is every right to say, hey, um, Todd, uh, Bob doesn't know about caltrops or door spikes or the importance of a 10-foot pole or half the stuff that you've put on your list. All that Bob knows is about dirt farming. So he would bring a shovel and maybe something he could hit things with, which could actually just be the shovel. He's definitely gonna bring food and uh, maybe a walking stick or something, right? When I'm building, when I'm building out that equipment list, I am, I am using meta knowledge. I've played this game before. I have ideas as far as the things that are important to bring in general. And so I'm bringing them. But that's a good kind of meta knowledge. That's me learning from my experience playing the game. Learning that, oh yeah, these things are always, they're evergreen supplies. You, you can't go wrong with having some caltrops try to slow something down behind you. Can't, can't go wrong with having spikes to either nail doors open or shut, depending on what your need is. Rope is always good a 10 foot pole for checking for traps or trying to trigger something from a safe distance right these are all things that through years of playing the game you realize yeah these are just good supplies to have until you get powerful enough and spells and things like that that you don't need them anymore but certainly starting out these are great supplies well how do i know that this is meta knowledge bob the dirt farmer doesn't know that, doesn't know these things. So that's one way of like the good fat of metagaming. We we say often, I will say often, that hey, you want people to learn the game, learn the game. And so yeah, if their first player dies from something horrible and they bring in the next character and that character, if they've learned anything at all, is gonna be better prepared than the, than the guy who died. Even if this new guy in a, just a complete fictional sense is a, a fellow nobody who's never gone anywhere. Just by virtue of you as the player have made some progress in your mastery of the game this player this character is going to be better prepared does that make sense in the fiction by itself no 
do do we nod our head and say good job? Yes, because that is the good kind of metagame. As far as this kind of thing, this happens too, right? We're playing a, a, an adventure. Let's say we're playing a one shot. We know we're at, maybe we're at a con or doing something and we can see that the GM is setting up this kind of Aragorn in the prancing pony kind of scene, right? And this happens a lot. Whether good or bad, you know, you enter the tavern and there's gonna be one guy whose cloak is up, he's in the corner in shadow and he's doing this. And look, we all know this guy is important. Now, maybe in real life, in a real tavern, we don't even notice that guy. There's so much stuff going on, the sights, the sounds. We're not, we're not paying attention to some guy who's sitting in the corner trying like hell not to be seen, essentially, in a pillar of shadow over them. But in a one-shot situation where we know, hey, we got to get to the adventure, we're probably going to beeline for that guy. Or we're going to keep our eye on that guy because that's just too much, right? The GM has kind of called them out and we are noticing that call and reacting on it. Even if our characters, Bob the Dirt Farmer, you know, would be overwhelmed because it's his first time in a tavern and oh my gosh, they come in pints and like they're not, you know, they're not paying attention to that stuff. But on that meta level, we know this guy is probably important. We're going to, we're going to pay attention to him or we're going to go talk to him. He's the guy that's going to have stuff that what we need right all these things that we learn all these different tropes that we kind of we can learn from the funny thing here is this situation this guy got into was kind of like an anti-trope or they missed a trope because there's a lot of background in narrative fiction with gods powerful beings and other things uh, putting on the clothes of meek creatures to either just to mess with people or to try to test someone's goodness or badness of character. I think in Beauty and the Beast, right, is I think the, 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 the prince who has turned into a beast has done so because he wronged some poor woman who was actually a, a, a witch or a powerful sorceress, right, disguised. Zeus, you know, in Greek legends would come around, uh, you know, disguise himself as cows and all kinds of stuff like that. I think, I want to say it's Oedipus, but I might be wrong. I think there's a scene in Oedipus where Oedipus and, and the king get kind of cross wires and part of that is because he doesn't recognize the king or I don't know I forget I might be off on that one but there's putting Oedipus aside there's untold amounts of times that a powerful being has decided to become under the guise of a a weak being to kind of get their groove on or test people or whatever so it's not like from a pure meta gaming standpoint that this character might not be what they appear to be. It really was even that second level where they said, well, it's not so much that he's a meek player, but he doesn't know the name. Or I think that was what it was, is that they didn't know the name. They were kind of trying to think up a name on the spot, which was that cue to them to the aha, this person's not doing it. Now, I don't know if the guy knows, who the who person who posted this knows for sure whether the GM did that on purpose or whether he had, okay, Zeus is hanging around as a dirt farmer. And then just Zeus didn't know the name or he just hadn't thought of a name for the Dirt Farmer because maybe he thought the players weren't going to really go that direction. I don't know any of the, any of the context, whether the, the GM was really playing possum by pretending to think up a name on the spot or pretend to stumble like they didn't know who this was. And of course, part of it might have been that this GM was just tired of his party he was rolling random NPCs. So he decided just when they decided to roll this particular NPC, he then took them and turned them into something that they weren't before, right? That maybe in the world where they just pass by and say, tip their, doff their caps to Bob the Dirt Farmer, that that's just Bob the Dirt Farmer. But because they decided for no reason other than just sheer chaos to go and decide to kind of roll Bob the Dirt Farmer and steal his two coppers and murder him in front of his wife and children, that the GM said, you know what, I've had enough of this. Bob the Dirt Farmer is actually Zeus in disguise. In fact, I've actually often seen the reverse of this kind of scenario come up, in which the GMs, and I don't know why GMs seem to be, uh, I, I see there's a high obsession with introducing a, uh, a big bad guy, big bad evil guy, the, the, the antagonist of the campaign, introduce them to the party at the beginning in some way kind of utilizing the same scenario is they're just going to be like man hiding in the back or they're going to be their benefactor somewhere they put them in constant contact with the party and the problem with that is is this kind of scenario exactly that when you put any kind of creatures or beings in constant contact with the party either just for from sheer murder hoboism or just chaos or just sometimes players will get an inkling and it's smart and then maybe they get that inkling because when you're dealing with this particular NPC, the, the, the GM is trying to either, trying to hint at them that's a big bad evil guy, or they're trying, they just kind of, just 
by nature, they want to sort of show off this character a little bit. They give him a little extra. So you have, like, if you see one Joe the Dirt Farmer, it's like, yeah, he's just a guy in rags. He's got a shovel. He's going off to do some dirt. Whereas then you look at Bob the Dirt Farmer, and then suddenly there's, like, a little more to him. He stands a little taller. His shoulders are a little bit more squared. He seems to have a glint in his eye. Something that sort of hints that there's a little bit more here. And because I think players are used to that, either used to, A, this person then turning on them or, or tricking them or doing something or being the evil guy, then you, you know, you know what, why do we got to wait from... From, for Bob the Dirt Farmer to become the 20th level lich at the end of this thing, we're just going to eliminate that right now. Like, you just get that thing, like, that guy is a little bit too much going on for a dirt farmer. I don't know whether it's intentional, but he's not, so I'm just going to cut the legs out from under him now, and he'll be done. And this totally happens, because GMs are unprepared for this. They are sometimes are trying to do something where the, the big bad evil guy is about the same levels, the party, kind of on the way up. But because they put them so close... Party gets a, just a, just, you know, they just get their, uh, they get their fire up a little bit for one reason or another, then suddenly they're attacking this person before the GM is ready. Or in this case, and, you know, I've seen this where it's like someone who was the GM in this case is then posting like, oh my God, help me, do I TPK my players? Because they attack this dirt farmer who's really the big bad evil guy. It's kind of, what do you do? The TPK scenario in any kind of forms is always interesting because it really brings out a lot of what makes different GMs different GMs and their philosophies. I tend to be a, hey, let the dice fall where they may, but my caveat there is, is that I think that the more openness you give your players, I, the more choices they have in players in A, how they, if and if they interact with, an, with a, in a, a particular encounter at all, and how much choice they have and how they do that. That to me is sort of inversely proportional to how much I feel like I should, I, I feel like that I shouldn't play it straighter. I'm saying that's really poorly. What I mean by that is if the players have a lot of choice in whether to encounter, whether to interact with encounter at all, right? So they see Bob the farmer, and I have in my notes, Bob the farmer is secretly Zeus, and he's there to do something, and this happens. Okay, so the players, I'm not forcing this thing on them. Bob is just working his life. Maybe they've seen Bob a few times. Maybe they've, you know, done something to Bob and Bob decides to shake their fist as they're passing by and they can easily just forget about it or they can choose to do something about it. If they decide to do something about it, then I'm less, I, I feel less likely to, okay, I got to fudge things because they're going out of their way in a sense to come after a Bob. If how they, how they manage this encounter is up to them. So, okay, they're, I'm not, so once they've made this decision to approach Bob the dirt farmer, I haven't suddenly stuck them in a cell where they can't escape. They can try to uh, disengage at any moment, like when Bob drops his rags and you see the holy raiment of godliness and Zeus's aura and everything springs out and he turns eight feet tall and he tells them, behold, and you know, I am Zeus. Okay, have I trapped the players there or whatever? Or could they just drop their stuff, crap their pants and run? If they can do that, and they choose not to, but the option is there for them. It's an open field, the road's right there, town's not far, Zeus doesn't really care about them. He could just, you know, blast them with lightning at any at any moment. It's more, he's, this is what he was kind of waiting for, is just to be able to spring this on somebody. But at the same time, because he's Zeus and you just can't roll like that, if they just start trying to hack at him with their primitive mortal weapons, you know, he's, he's gonna have to at least respond to a certain level, but can they escape from that? Do they have options to get out? Now, of course, sometimes those options are, you know, removed because of circumstances. You know, let's say they decide to attack and Zeus gets a high initiative, then maybe I, I think about it, well, is Zeus going to just strike him down because he could, or is he going to laugh or do something else? Play it by ear, but generally speaking, they, they've got options to disengage out of there. They can change their minds anytime and go. This is not a linear dungeon where they enter each room and the door behind them closes, and then they can't escape until they face this particular encounter. Right? That's the kind of thing that if I feel like I keep pushing them into encounters, and they have no choices really whatsoever. As soon as they hit into one room, that encounter is on, and it's off until either, and it's on until either they're finished or the encounters or the enemy is finished, and that's it. Then I, I feel like it's your, you've taken a lot of the control away from them. The more control you take away from them, I think the more you have to be judicious on the force. You, but that's not the kind of game I play. I don't play those games. I don't like that. I, hey, if you open that door and you see that there's a, 
you know, like that sign in Big Drum, Big Trouble in Little China. They open, he opens the door, and there's a whole bunch of bad guys on the other side. And then he just shuts the door and says, "Okay, we might be trapped." Right here, they have choices. There's a whole building behind them. They could try to run, hide, maybe find another exit, whatever they could do, or they can go forward, or they can maybe surrender and see if they get a deal, whatever you know, from Lopan. They have options. The more when I. The more options the players have, the more that I can feel like, hey, look, they can make their choices, make their uh, their decisions, and roll the dice how they see fit. And then if a TPK comes up, a TPK, a TPK comes up. But if I'm running a very linear sort of puzzle dungeon, and they got to get through five rooms, and each room is basically very much going to be a, you know, you can't leave until it's finished. Well, then I would feel more, I, I would feel with more of my responsibility to try to figure out how this is going to play out. And I would probably think twice about a TPK in any one of those encounters because the players really can't control much about it. I have put them in this essentially just a giant trap and I'm either wearing down their resources or I'm doing something else and so yeah that, that a TPK might not be appropriate because they're not making all the choices here they didn't know this was the way the dungeon was they didn't know this is how it was gonna go the dungeon is where I want them to be it's not like they did something wrong they're just going through the dungeon that I'm kind of pushing them into and forcing them into room after room of encounter doesn't give them a lot of leeway to make a lot of choices and they can't really make informed choices because they don't know that there's five rooms. They don't know that each one of these things is gonna has to be conquered before the next one and that they're gonna be basically trapped until they figure it out or die. They don't know. So at those points, I would say, I don't know if I would feel good giving something that was a TPK or, I, or if they were starting to get in the realm of a TPK, I might feel a little bit something of it. And I'm somebody who's fine with TPKs, but just I feel like, hey, players should have choices. But then again, I'm also not a fan of those kind of puzzly dungeons, those kind of puzzly spaces where you just you get in and you, you have this kind of A, B, A, B choices. And those are connected, right? And balance is also connected. I think I've, I'm pretty sure I've done videos on balancing before, or at least I've mentioned it. I'm not a super huge fan of balancing, particularly how 5th edition does it, but a lot of that is because the way I play these games, the way I like them to be played is that I can make these decisions, right? I can look down and if I play it smart and there's an army of goblins over there, I can see them from a distance. I can kind of scout it out. I can Say, hey, there's an army full of goblins down there. I'm not going down there. Well, let's go the other way. And not set encounter after set encounter after set encounter. Because if all the encounters are set and it's only about kind of it, the game changes to one of really thinking on the thinking on the go and figuring out kind of your approach, how you could avoid things. If you see an army of goblins down there, how much gold do we have? Can we can we bribe our way through? Hey, maybe we can buy them and have our own army of goblins. Maybe we can uh, try to sneak through in the night if, if if the other ways around it are really difficult, or we need to we are you know our objective is in the goblin camp. Maybe they kidnap somebody we're trying to rescue, or maybe we have to hang back and watch them and see see what you know what their guard rotation is. Maybe they're waiting for something, or maybe they're going to try to move this prisoner, and we could try to get them on the road when there's going to be fewer of them right these are all choices i'm making so at this point if, if that's the players and they're making all these choices me as a jam hey i don't have to balance the 500 goblins it's 500 goblins you figure it out but i'm not pushing them and all of a sudden you come around the corner 500 goblins roll initiative right that's where i and then it's like okay well we didn't have any choices we just it was just we were going to turn a corner or do whatever and it was going to be there and that's kind of a game feel right because it's not necessarily that you can't ever turn corners and be there yet random encounters happen but generally you have ways to kind of mitigate that and it comes down to that if the answer to a situation is oh if i'd only done this differently which i could have done the situation might turn out really differently that puts you in one boat if you're in the like well this is just a set thing it was a set piece it was going to happen no matter what that's kind of in another boat if it's in the it's gonna happen no matter what, then I, yeah, I, th I think balancing is more of a, a feel thing because you're taking taking a lot of the things away from the PC. You were, you, were give, you were putting them in a situation and then it kind of, I think it just puts the onus on you to figure out how to make it fair. If the players have had a chance to do all their planning, to figure out how they're gonna approach it, to attack it in whatever way they want or not attack it in they want, then, you know, to me, it's, it's on you as players to decide how you're going to do it and that concept of was it too much or was it not enough or was it just right i don't think applies uh, and actually that reminds me of another reddit post i saw which kind of had that same question of 
fairness of an encounter. And I put a poll on Twitter and I asked, hey, what do you, what would you consider a fair encounter? Is it one that is balanced to the party? Is it one that is kind of optional? Again, like I've been saying before, this idea that you can, you, you can either uh, engage it, not engage it, choose how you're gonna engage it. Is it one where you have an exit? You know, you step in the room, it's 50 bugbears, but the door's still open and you can easily get the back out of the room? Or is it something else? And I got, I didn't get a ton of votes, but I, I don't have a huge Twitter following, so I guess that's par for the course there. But it was interesting. I think some people were saying they, they thought that fair was basically to the level of the PCs. I definitely go on fair is how much choice do they have to engage this or not? That's my fairness. But that all stemmed from this Reddit post in which a poster was trying to figure out whether the GM was fair or not with their counters. And they had, so the situation was in the game is their GM, I, I think these, I think it was an online, well, I mean, everything's an online game now, but I, again, I think a game where the, the players are all online, though I don't know for heart, for sure if they weren't, you know, real life friends who were just online or just kind of a random roll 20 type game. And it seemed like these players, they were kind of one set of players that maybe didn't get along with the other set so well. I think the, the poster mentioned something that they weren't too keen. Anyway, they kind of split off at one point and went on this sort of solo little mission. The three of them went off on this mission that had been po posted wherever in the fictional world as basically suitable for a three-man team. So they took their three-man team and they went and they ended up fighting, ended up in a, a, a kind of a, a room with a, a, a mimic, which they correctly figured out there was a chest in the middle of a, a big big room that was empty mimic in it fought the mimic or discovered oh that chest the mimic i think they shot at it which exposes the mimic the mimic ran away down the other side of this big room but when they stepped in i think three displacer beasts attacked and things unraveled there and he was asking like was this fair because i think he felt like the gm was kind of out to get them and uh i tried to drill down with that person a little bit on it because my first thought was again like i think like hey fair unfair like how much you could have backed out of there at any time were there and i was trying to get them to think i always think it's think about it what decisions could you have made differently because i think a lot of times now and i think it's very easy with the internet is to hop on and try to find people who agree with you Bad GM. Oh, three displacer beasts. That's beyond deadly. This is a terrible, terrible GM. This is a horrible, horrible thing. And yes, I think VSCR, however you want to calculate it, I think, yeah, it comes off as to being basically super deadly. But I think as anyone who's played with CR knows, it's a very imperfect system. Maybe it was meant to be very hard. Certainly it was not a mandatory mission. They went, they picked one up, maybe it was on the fly, maybe this is out of a book, I don't know, but it wasn't mandatory. They never said they were trapped. They didn't have to do the things they did. They could have run away at any time. Could they have done things differently? And it seemed like they, he wasn't sure, but then it turned out, this is where things get fuzzy, as they usually do. When I drilled down a little bit, it turned out that they were new players, number one, and that their GM was very unhelpful to them as new players. Didn't help them. They, I think they tried, or this person said that they tried to ask questions about stuff. The GM was very, super unhelpful. Um, and then they did the thing that happens a lot, which is kind of, it's, it's like the TPK. It's like the first, you know, I feel like a TPK kind of goes, you have your chances. You know, if you ever see the game charts, they say there's chances of winning. And then at some point they just rock it up in one direction or another on some key moment, like, oh, it was about 50-50 that they were gonna win the game. And then this happened and boom, it goes off a cliff. One of the players, one of the characters went in a barbarian, went into a room, ended up getting surrounded by the displacer beasts. Or I think the way they put it was separated by the, from the rest of the party from the displacer beasts. And I think the thing that they said to me in one of their responses was, well, what were we gonna do? Like, let them, let them die? So we had to go in. But it's usually that having to go in mentality, that having to save everybody is what leads to the TPK. I've seen it firsthand. Player A does something, maybe that thing is what you want him to do. You know, as a team, you're like, this is the plan, they do it and just fails or just something bad happens or there's something unknown. Like you rush the mimic and three displacer beasts show up. Sometimes it's doing something where you don't want them to do, where somebody's just foolhardy as a character or player and they decide to go, you know, Leroy Jenkins on a situation and then you're, you're left holding the bag. When other players just kind of start following them in and not assessing the situation or not trying to figure out, well, what should I do that's survivable or, you know, maybe smarter, you know, they go in, I gotta get, I gotta get to the, I gotta get to the barbarian who's about to die and feed him a health potion or I can do this. And maybe there are other options, but they end up going with that. I'm going to charge into the rescue. And then what happens is they go down and then sometimes multiple people then are charging the rescue or sometimes it's just one after another. These 
your, your characters are charging in. Oh, well, now we got two guys. Well, maybe I can drag them both out of the room, and you charge in. Sometimes from a purely tactical level, the Barbarian goes down, there's three to place their beasts, and now the Mimic is running back to attack. Do you go in to save them? Nope. Farewell, dear Barbarian. We knew you well. Or maybe we knew you not so well. Maybe we can come back and get your body later, but you're you're gone, right? Because th there's just, once the Barbarian goes down, I think these other two guys were casters or they, they weren't like they were, you know, you're not in a good spot. So the answer to, well, what should we do, leave them there, is sometimes it's yes. If you're just playing like a, a purely tactical, smart emotion, you're, you're setting your emotions aside and saying, this is, I go in there, it's over for me. I'm not, even if I give him a potion and he gets eight hit points back or whatever, he's now surrounded by three displacer beasts and a mimic I'm going to be surrounded by those same ones. I only have a handful of HP. The, you know, we've already seen, if we didn't know anything about this place of beasts, and they didn't, that they attack multiple times. And I think that they, at least by the time the, the barbarian got attacked, I think they saw that these, these things are hitting him more than once. There's no way. There's no way. So you think, well, there, that settles it. The GM's unfair. Of course the players are going to follow them. Of course they're going to do this. So therefore it's unfair. Well, maybe not. I mean, I think... There were other things this, this player told me that made me think that maybe this GM is just not a great GM, or at least not a great GM for them. But, you know, Displacer Beasts, I don't know, they're not invisible. I don't know what steps. If I see a chest in the middle of a big empty room, and granted I shoot at it and it turns into a mimic and runs off, I'm still thinking that's... I'm still worried about that room. Like, what else could I do? Could I drop... Do I have something like a Molotov cocktail or a flaming oil that I can throw in there to try to see more? Do I... Can I peer around the corners and look? Right? There's... There's a lot. Can we hold the doorway? What's going on? You know, I, I, they said something like, well, the room was seemingly big enough that the Mimic got to one end and their their spells couldn't reach. But, you know, I'm, I'm old school. I, I'm not just carrying around my spells. I'm carrying around a crossbow or a short bow. And I'm pretty sure that I would have... My, my thing would have been, I'm going to take the penalty, whatever it is, it, from extreme range or long range, whatever it is, and say, I'm just going to take that penalty. I'm going to keep nailing that Mimic until that Mimic decides to come to me because if he's 60 you know, yards away or whatever it is, 80 feet, 60 feet. Make him run and charge through the open space and do that. And if he truly is, if it is truly by itself and nothing and, and nothing comes out to decide to, uh, you know, to object to my firing arrows, well, then, you know, so so be it. But if there is, you know, and I don't know what the displacer would be. Did they just come in? Was there a trap? There was some other trap that was triggered that, you know, opened up compartments or dropped them out of, <clears throat> some kind of inner space into the room. I don't know. That concept of fairness, right? It's very much in the eye of the beholder. And I think, I feel like it's too easy sometimes just to look at the GM and say, oh, it's unfair, it's on you. Well, one, as players, that shouldn't be my first line of questioning. My the players should be like, ooh, what could we have done differently? If you couldn't have done anything differently, if you look at it and go, you know, we were just dropped into an arena type space and the GM just pounded us until we died, <clears throat> I would say that's yeah, probably not fair. You didn't have any choices. You didn't sign up to be in the arena. No one said to you, hey, this is a really tough arena thing. You're going to go up against 50 guys and you're going to be pounded in. You go, oh, yeah, it's a good idea. I'm going to do that. You know, you're just dropped in and this just poof, happened. It's, yeah, it's probably unfair. But if you look back at it, you want to look at it at least. I think the healthy player perspectives look back and say, well, what did, we, what did we not do? Like, what did I miss? And I think as a GM, particularly with new players, and I think they asked the GM this and he basically refused to tell them. I think they said something like, well, what could we have done differently? If you're at the GM and you're running this encounter, and again, I know that dice and things can have otherwise, because sometimes you can end up, you're using random encounters, you're kind of playing an old school type game. Sometimes stuff can happen. And you could say, hey man, at a certain point, you guys went in the swamps, I rolled for an encounter, you got a red dragon, I rolled for distance, I rolled for surprise, you guys were surprised, turned out he was 30 feet away around ducking down in some brackish water and just popped up and did it like the part you did wrong was like three steps before this was not re recognizing that these swamps are dangerous when they had signs posted they were dangerous or just knowing from system knowledge that swamps are dangerous and have things like dragons in them right that's one thing sometimes that can happen but mostly you should be able to say as a jam uh, dice being what they are you know i can't say for sure but uh, the uh, these three uh, displacer beasts were kind of hanging out on the sides after you open the door they kind of went to the sides if you had a mirror or something way you could have kind of ducked in and peeked in and looked really quickly or maybe you if you had tried to look for shadows maybe there's some kind of lighting and maybe they had just little indistinct shadows or that you could 
sense of vibrations. I don't know. These are things you could have done or, well, you didn't have to chase the mimic to the far side of the room because that kind of did it. And if you'd taken a moment to look around the room, like stepped in the doorway and taken the full room in view, you would have seen three displacer beasts. But because you were, you were sort of just looking through the doorway and you just kind of ran in, you didn't have a chance to see them because there were shadows and whatever. You should be able to say. And as a new, if I'm with new players, I want to inform them. I want to teach them. Getting back to full circle to the beginning, I want them to get this knowledge of the game, this kind of good, fatty, meta knowledge that they want. I want them to learn. I want them to know. So I want them to know. Hey, you should have done this. Hey, you forgot about this tool that you had. Remember you guys had oil and, 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 and you know, and Tinder? You should have dropped the pool of oil and lit it, and that would have held the displacer beast back for long enough for you to get away or you do something else or whatever you could have done or you for, you didn't check for traps or you didn't make you didn't try to look around the room and anything more than just the bee lining for the chest or whatever that situation was you didn't do it so next time get to that room or a room like it take those steps and hopefully they learn from it but they didn't do that so that's what made me think they're more than a bad gm more than balance but listen I've rambled on long enough. I gotta make some coffee, get ready for work. My family's gonna bust through the door any minute. But so let me know if uh, any of these topics floated your boat. Let me know if there's anything you want me to talk about that I haven't talked about in a while or need more. I'm always working on trying to think up more things to do with hexes. I did post a hex um, to my Ko-Fi or my Patreon. I will, if I can remember, I will drop a link in the show notes so you can grab and take a look at it. It's not much. I just made kind of a cool, I thought it was a cool terrain. I kind of dropped a hex over it and added some landmarks that can serve as inspiration. But if you're running kind of a hex crawl campaign, you just need a little bit of interesting wilderness with some ideas for adventuring going on, you can grab that image and check it out. I will drop the link. But have a great rest of your week and hopefully I will have some more substantive, interesting things to talk about or more materials to cover soon when I can get my act together and find the time. But uh, hey, if you like this and I know, again, I'm rambling. It's a bit of a ramble. I'm, I'm sort of off script just because I am terrible with the scripts. I just kind of had some bullet notes, tried to run with it. I do kind of like that I got. I feel like I was able to kind of bring it full circle, which... I'm proud of myself for, but anyway, if you if you enjoy this, if you enjoy what I do, you want to help me out, you know, thumbs up the video is great. Subscribing to the channel if you're not already is great. Obviously, I have Ko-Fi and, and Patreon or Coffee or Patreon if you'd like to contribute in those ways. But anything you do can help me out, help me, uh, you know, just get resources, get things that help me kind of keep keep this train moving, keep the justification for spending time out of my days to do this as opposed to something else. And, you know, hopefully I can afford some better equipment and just, you know, I need to get a new laptop at some point. So all that stuff kind of impacts stuff I can do for myself and for this content. So any, th any way you can help me, um, I appreciate it. But have a great rest of your day, whatever day that happens to be. Be safe, be healthy. I'll talk to you later. Yes.